Good morning, everyone. I'm Quinn Wisson from Vertical Measures, and I'm here hosting VM's monthly webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Building Your Content Marketing Machine, and will be presented by our very special guest, John Doherty. John is based in San Francisco, and he's the founder of Credo, a marketplace connecting great businesses with the best digital and growth marketing consultants and agencies in the world. In the past, John ran marketing at hotpads.com and growth marketing at Trulia Rentals, where he built a team and led growth across all the organic, organic cha channels. So we're excited to have him here today. Before we get started and I hand over the presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to note. Today's webinar will be available for viewing by tomorrow, and we'll go ahead and send everyone out an email with the link to both the recording and the slides if you'd like to review. We're also happy to answer any of your questions. So if you take a peek at your webinar interface, you'll see a little section where you can send us anything that you'd like to ask John at the end of his presentation. Also, you can tweet along with us using the hashtag VMWebinar or ask questions that way. Also, if you have any technical problems, let me know or feel free to just sign off and come back on and usually that corrects the problem. So with all of my notes complete, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to our special guest presenter, John Doherty. Hello there, everyone. Quinn, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you Vertical Measures uh, for having me today. I'm super excited to be here. Hello everyone out there in internet land. I was just thinking this morning and realizing that this I believe this is actually the first webinar that I've ever done, um, which is amazing to me. So I'm super happy to be here and excited uh, excited to do it. So today, I'm going to as Quinn said, I'm going to be talking to you about building your content marketing machine. And as Quinn briefly said, um, I've done this a, a couple times at a couple of different brands. Um, biggest success was at hotpads.com, which is a brand that's owned by Zillow, a rental apartment house rentals focused brand. So I'm going to talk to you kind of about the, the process that we went through and, and help you put together a grid for thinking about building out either a content marketing machine for yourself, for your own company, um, or for your clients if you're with an agency. So real quick, who am I? As Quinn said, I'm the founder of Credo, which is a, a digital is a marketplace to connect businesses with digital marketing consultants and agencies. Uh, I founded it about three years ago under a different name, the name of Hire Gun. I rebranded it about a month ago. Um, and this is this is me. This is who I am. You can find me Doherty J up on Twitter. Please tweet at me. Um, I'm on there all the time and super uh, super responsive. Um, and uh, other than working at Truly Rentals and Hotpads, before that I was at Digital Marketing Agency Distilled in New York City for about two and a half years um, as a consultant. So today we're going to talk about content marketing. Oh, first of all, I should also say that I have I have about 90 slides and 30 minutes. I thought it was 45 minutes. So instead of two slides a minute, I have to do three slides a minute. So I'm going to talk quickly and uh, hopefully have you know, 5, 10, maybe even 15 minutes for questions at the end uh, today. So as Quinn said, please you know, tweet those, put them in, uh, put them in the, the GoToMeeting chat, um, and we'll get to some of those. So today we're going to talk about content marketing. And if you're here, you're either bought into the idea of content marketing or, you, uh, or you're curious about it, or maybe um, or, or maybe you've had some bad experiences with it. So um, some of the results that I've seen and heard of with content marketing are uh, they're, they're vast. There are so many case studies out there. Um, I've, I saw a site personally change from buying about $15,000 worth of links a month to earning links from sites like REI naturally because of great content. Um, I've seen uh, sites grow audiences by tens of thousands from scratch from literally nothing or almost nothing and contribute meaningful, meaningful conversions to a business. Um, it also, content marketing personally made me over $70,000 from one product launch and the marketing around it um, when I launched Credo back in November. Um, and I've also seen it obtain millions of visits and earn shares of some of the biggest celebrities online for free. One example I can think of is work that my old agency Distilled did um, with, I believe it was Concert Hotels that got tweeted by Axel Rose of Guns N' Roses um, for free. So, uh, you know, people talk about uh, paying influencers to share stuff. Why not create phenomenal content that they just want to amplify, you know, to their huge audience for free? So some of you are probably thinking, uh, we gave content marketing a shot and it didn't work, right? Content marketing didn't work for us. We're in a boring industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've all heard it. Um, challenge accepted. I think uh, it's possible for every business to succeed, whether you're B2C, B2B, peer-to-peer. -peer. I heard one called B2D, which I'm not even sure what that stands for, uh, some Silicon Valley lingo, but challenge accepted. So let's talk about some kinds of content uh, that are out there, kinds of content that you can do, right? You can do infographics. 
which were huge a few years ago and still still work well. Um, you can do white papers, you can do blog posts, you can do data visualizations, you can do ebooks that people have to sign up for in order to get it sent to them. You can do email drip campaigns. Um, all and and there are many many more that I'm sure you can uh, that I'm sure you can think of and that you've tried. But but hang on. I think what we're doing here is we're actually putting the cart before the horse. If we just start thinking about what kind of content you know, could we create, it's definitely an important part of the process, but we need to, we need to step back um, real quick. First of all, content marketing has absolutely exploded in popularity. It's gotten, it's gotten huge. You know, if you look at link building compared to content marketing, um, uh, content marketing just overtook uh, link building in about 2013, right? Uh, really post uh, the Penguin algorithm. Uh, that Google rolled out in, uh, I believe it was April 2012. Um, but a lot of this content is pretty meh. It's pretty not awesome. You know, you, you search for 10 ways to, in quotes, and you get uh, almost 23 million results in Google. Uh, how to tie a tie. Not in quotes, 103 million different results there, right? Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. You know, look at all those images uh, that are there. Those, those you know, they, they look like they were put together. They look like something I would put together in, like, PowerPoint um, or Paint. Um, so uh, the idea is we want to go we want to go above this, but we also want to figure out a scalable process for doing this. Um, so th this is what I like to call a content machine. How you go from start um, from a minimum viable product, a minimum viable machine, all the way up to you know you're you're off to the races and everything everything is churning well. Um, so if you've ever said what I what I showed you earlier, if we tried content marketing and it didn't work for us. I believe that you didn't have a machine uh, that worked. For, for you and for your business. So here's the, the content marketing machine uh, formula that I've come up with. Um, and I'm, I'm not a mathematics major. I got a C plus in statistics in college. Um, but I, uh, th this is kind of the formula that I've put together where it's idea plus creation and then multiply that by promotion. Added measurement, and this is how you this is how you build the machine. And there's also you know ideation. There's a ton to it. Creation. There's a ton to it. Promotion. There's a ton to it. Measurement. There's a ton to it. And we're going to unpack some of this today. As you all know, if you've ever put together a machine, you've ever looked under the hood of a car. This is one of my favorite cars. It's a Ferrari in the background. Um, a machine is a sum of its parts, uh, and every part has to work together. If one part's not working, then you know you're wasting gas. You know, you're, you're smelling things burning, uh, or you know, at worst, not even on the road um, anymore. If, if one thing is out of whack, then everything is out of whack. Um, and Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Um, it, it took you know, thousands of years, literally. Um, and your machine won't won't be built in a day either. So this is a, I want to remind you, this is a process um, that we go through. So let's talk about from uh, from your idea to to the idea of I want to build a content machine to a minimum viable product, and, and uh, I'm saying let's build a skateboard, and this will make sense to you here in just a, a second. So first of all, what's, a, what's an MVP? If you're, if you're not in, the, uh, in Silicon Valley or in the, the software as a service world, you, you may not, might not know this term. Um, an MVP stands for Minimum Viable Product. Um, it's a, or we, we could call it um, Minimum Viable Content Machine, right? MVCM um, is what we, what we could call this. Um, it's a working first iteration based off of a hypothesis. Basically, it's how, it's how you get started, but it's not just a wheel or, or something like that, but it's actually something that works. So this is a, a graphic that I've seen being passed around where you, know, you don't start with a wheel and then go to two wheels. Two wheels with nothing else is kind of pointless. And then you go to like a car body. Um, you know, a car body without wheels, as we saw earlier, you know, doesn't work. Um, so we, we start off small. We start with something that works, right, uh, a skateboard, and then we progress on to a scooter, progress on to a bicycle, you know, maybe then a motorcycle, then a car. You know, then a rocket ship, um, and we're off to the races. Um, so we're starting. We're starting small. So in order to start small at your own at your own company, um, you have to ask yourself. You have to do the the pre work and, and start putting in, putting together some ideas. So we have to look at what's the what's the competition. Uh, what's your content? What's your competition's content? And uh, and what are they doing? Right? What are they doing well? What are they not doing well? You know. So at Hopheads, we looked at our competitors and realized they all had blogs, but not a lot of great content. Some are cranking out a ton of content, which they've since stopped. Others, not so much. Um, and so we ask ourselves these questions. Um, you know, where are the gaps? What kind of content is available to us? What's our unique spin? What are our users going to find interesting? And some of these, especially number five, uh, this is going to take some, uh, some iteration, some rapid testing, um, new ideas to figure out really what's resonating with your audience and, and what they want. Um, so very quickly, you want to do an assets audit. Um, this takes a little bit of time, but figure out basically everything that you already have at your company. 
Um, so at Hophead, we realized that we had we had a blog and a subdomain that didn't get much traffic. Um, we had consistent traffic to this, but it was about 600 visits a month, um, so it was tiny. Um, we had the ability to publish longer form content. We had a budget for content, which was great. We had a designer that was eager for help. We had pages that had already earned nominal links. Um, you know, so we had we had the start of a solid foundation, and we already received some natural coverage. Um, Wired wrote about us. Lifehacker wrote about us. Um, but you know, th this had kind of dried up in the last few years. So we asked ourselves, what can we do better than anyone? Like, what what's gonna what, what do we think might uh, might work for us? Um, at Hopheads, we we did maps. Hopheads does maps better than better than anyone. Um, Hopheads was actually the first map-based rental searching. Of course, now everyone in that space and on the for sale side also have uh, have maps. But Hopheads was the first. Um, and so then we had to ask, how are we going to produce content here? Um, and you know, this varies by company, but you always have a mix of, of these four. You have, uh, you know, you might have some budget, you probably have expertise, uh, you know, you might have a lot of extra time, and you, so you can, you know, spend a lot of time creating content. Or you might have a lot of people, you know, and, and you always have some combination um, of this. And I would argue that that eventually you need all of this. I know Quinn talked about some of this in her webinar that she did last month, um, which was fantastic. So start off asking yourself, what can you start today? And that's bolded for a reason because you, I, I'm a firm believer in just in coming up with ideas and putting them out there, put them out there into the market and see what's going to work. Um, you know, so if, if you're a design-heavy company, you know, start creating fantastic, you know, start creating graphics that you think are going to be interesting. Um, if you're writing, if you, you have a lot of writers, you're writing heavy, create the best damn ebooks possible. Um, if you have a ton of data, take a fresh angle on it and, you know, and spin it and, and help people think about it in a new way. Um, so people often talk about, you know, content is king, um, you know, promotion is queen or whatever. I, I don't like those, uh, those ways of talking about it, but I think the point stands that uh, you know th there's no promotion without creation, so you have to nail creation first before you can promote it. But also, content doesn't really go anywhere if you don't have promotion. So we're going to talk about both of those, right? Don't put the cart before the horse. This is the last time you'll see this, I promise. Um, and also, don't forget to measure, right? You can't win, you can't build a cohesive strategy if you're not measuring what's actually working. Um, and also, strategies are not set in stone, especially at the very beginning. Um, and and Honestly, throughout the whole course of your company, your strategy should not be set in stone, right? They're always they always need to be open to change because what's working is always going to change as well. So, uh, so, so that gets you to the start of your your MVP. And so now we're going from your minimum viable content to you know to a bicycle. Now instead of pushing like on a skateboard, you know you have pedals. It's still manual, but it's a lot easier. You can go places a lot uh, a lot faster. So. Figuring out production, now you've started reading content, uh, creating content, excuse me, and you're getting an idea of what's working and what's not. You're measuring it, seeing that you know, this kind of content is working well for SEO, and this kind of content is working well for social, um, et cetera, and you're getting an idea if your current efforts are going to fit into, uh, into your goals uh, for content. So at Hotpads, we had three real uh, key performance indicators, KPIs and goals. Build an audience, get links for SEO, and then uh, third one was build a brand, right, which is kind of nebulous, but uh, but we'll get there in, in a little while. So what we already knew was that no one had really cracked the content code um, for renters. We knew what didn't work. We also didn't know from our competitors what did. You know, they, their strategies were all over the map. We knew from our parent company, Hophads is owned by Zillow. Um, that, and by the way, I, I left uh, Hophads back in, uh, or I, I left Zillow back in September, um, and Hop, I moved over from Hophads to Trulia last May. Um, so I'm, I'm no longer there. But uh, at Hophouse, we knew from our parent company, Zillow, that the, the kind of content that worked, that worked there. Um, they'd, been doing, they'd been investing in content marketing from the beginning, and that's how Zillow launched. So we, we had these ideas for content, right? Location-specific content, top metros, uh, interesting maps with available data, think pieces, graph data, you know, best neighborhoods, uh, best restaurants in you know, cities, major metros, uh, PR stunts. Um, you know, this is all stuff that we, that we could that we could do, and as we as we got into it, um, you know, we hired a content agency, um, had a content manager. Um, you know, these are these are the things that we realized from the uh, the different kinds of content that we tried. And this was honestly a six to nine to twelve month process where we started off doing blog posts and then layered on um, different you know different types of content. Um, and we this is what we came to realize uh, for us based off the team that we had. Um, we couldn't scale um, location specific content uh, within the budget that we had. There was no interest. In think pieces or in the graph data, um, best neighborhoods in city and that sort of content grow, drove great traffic, still drives great traffic. Um, but we weren't going to build a brand off of that. Um, interesting maps with available data, 
traffic links brand. People loved it. Um, and then PR stunts. Uh, once again, it's not it's not super scalable, but we got traffic, we got links, and it helped with our brand building. Um, so these are the ones that we that we went after after a, a bunch of you know iteration, uh, testing, and measuring. So we decided on a on a dual approach. Um, so I, I I kind of put the cart before the horse there, ironically, um, and talked about what worked. Um, but this is what we decided on as a dual approach, where we're going to do consistent. We decided to do con consistent quality content targeted at living in cities, moving, life changes, et cetera, and then higher quality, higher quality focused content such as data, maps, graphics, photos, that sort of thing. Um, so the question that's out there is uh, which, which do you think ultimately earned more links, got more traffic, and ultimately drove more qualified traffic? Um, and we'll get, there, we'll get there at the end. Um, so here's some of the, the content that we did. Best neighborhoods in city. Realized that there, were, uh, there was uh, search volume out there. Um, and it's pretty easy to rank for. So we started writing about, and a lot of us on the team had lived in different cities, so we started writing about you know, five best neighborhoods in Brooklyn, or I lived in Brooklyn, uh, best neighborhoods in Philadelphia, in Chicago, et cetera, and getting people from those areas to write about them as well. Um, this content was easy to create, easy to scale, um, and it drove, it drove great traffic. These were some of our, uh, our most trafficked uh, pieces, right? So best neighborhoods in Brooklyn, and right there we were number five. Um, you know, at one point we were number three. Um, and so you know, we decided to, to rinse and repeat it, right? Best neighborhoods in Chicago. Right there, you know, moving to Chicago. What's your what's the what's the best neighborhood? It's just super easy um, to keep you know to keep doing it, and was building you know starting to build an audience, and we could you know then do a lot more with them, dropping retargeting cookies on them, etc. Um, if we had wanted to, other types of keywords like most expensive neighborhoods uh, worked really well for us as well. You know, and those also had data inside of them, um, you know that that we had pulled from our own analytics or or whatever. Um, and then we so then we started going a little bit bigger and thinking outside the box. Of okay, what uh, what sort of content is going to be is, is different, right? And what, what information is locked up that we can take and make uh, make transparent? So we started doing our future construction series, which had access to ALN, which is a, a, a data um, data company within the uh, the rentals uh, rentals world. Um, and so we started writing about the future of construction in cities and where buildings were being built. Um, so we started with uh, with San Francisco, right? And I literally put this together with uh, I pulled the data from ALN. I I got the location information, uh, or the location da data, the, the latitude, longitude, um, from a from a free tool using the Bing Webmaster Tools API. Uh, plugged this into a, a Google Doc sheet and then mapped it. Um, and it, so it, so I did this. It literally took me a couple hours, and then I, I color coded it. it. Didn't get a ton of play, but I got responses from journalists that I reached out to who previously had not responded to me. So I decided to to try it again. Um, you know, so can we can we repeat it? Um, went to the, the we did the future of LA building construction, bingo it got picked up. Uh, you know Curbed LA picked it up. Uh, we did a couple more and then uh, the actually the editor of Curbed LA emailed all of the other editors at different curbed outlets and said this guy is doing these maps. Email him about when he's doing yours. So we got coverage across the country uh, from this and put one out every week for eight to ten weeks and consistently got you know more and more links and more interest. Um, so you know. And, and that was the start of our promotion there, right? So we, we figured out kind of how we were creating content. We had a content agency, we had an in-house person. I was creating some, um, and so we started figuring out our our, our creation engine, um, and you know realized that we could be we could be scrapping, we could be quick, and that this was going to work. And so we started thinking about promotion. And so this involves setting up some other channels to work. So no matter your team size, you you got to automate some of your some of your promotion, right? Email marketing, social media, advertising. Um, you know, a little bit of PR. You can you can hack PR a little bit by you know uh, by asking you know using Haro and those sorts of things um, to you know to get sources, um, which will then promote it for you. Uh, pro tip right there. Um, but you know, with email marketing, your advertising, you can automate all of this. So basic automation for every blog post that I publish uh, and that we publish there, um, I, I automatically automatically uh, email uh, my content subscriber list, post it Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. If you're doing advertising, you can set up ads to promote this on platform of your choice. Retargeting, you drop a pixel on them um, and follow them around the internet, um, and then you're uh, and, and from this you're measuring your important metrics. So now we we've had a bicycle that's been working. It's time to take it uh, take it to the next level, right? So now we're, we're at a motorcycle. We have an engine, which is fantastic. Uh, motorcycles have two seats, right? Bicycles, unless you're on one of those weird tandem bikes, only have one. Um, so now we now we have two seats and we have an engine. We're not having to do all of the manual work, right? This thing's starting to turn. We publish. We're figuring out the, you know, figuring out the process. Uh, you know, some some of the, the automated marketing is is happening here. Doing a little bit of manual outreach as well. Um, so it's at this point that I would say that you need a dedicated content manager. 
Um, I hired a content manager a little bit earlier than this at Hot Pads, uh, but as I've rethought it, I probably would have done it a little bit, little bit differently. Um, but you need a dedicated content manager um, at, at the latest at this point. Um, and you need someone that fits all of these. It's a, it's a tough job to fill. It's a tough person to find. Um, but they need to be creative. They need to be data informed, not just data driven, but data informed. Um, they need to be organized, uh, you know, to, to kind of hold all the different parts together, bias towards action, and understand promotion. Um, and once again, Quinn talked about this last month. Um, and so now you need to, now you, have, now you have your content manager in place and they're managing all of this. Um, you need to productize your automated promotion. Um, you, know, you, can, you can start off with just tying stuff together in WordPress or whatever with you know, plugins to MailChimp and, and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, once you get into real scale, right, and we were dealing with, with a lot of traffic at, at Hotpads, you know, we needed a team to, to put it together, right? So we weren't just tying everything together you know, with tools like Zapier and that sort of thing, which I love Zapier and I use them a lot at Credo. Um, but uh, you, know, you, you actually need to, to productize this and make it, you know, make it more scalable. Um, you know, in order to do um, you know time, timely emails and, and that sort of thing, um, and, and there are a lot of there are a lot of tools out there that you can use as well, right? We use Sprinkler for scheduling content. You can, you can use Hootsuite or Buffer. Um, there, there are so many out there as well. Um, not, and now it's time to to really put together a calendar. To this point, I hadn't talked about an editorial calendar because I didn't. Uh, you know, at, at the beginning, you're, you're testing things as quickly as you can. You're kind of throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks, um, and measuring it and, and iterating very quickly. Um, now it's the time to put together a calendar because you probably have multiple hands on your, you know, on your project, um, and you know you might have a team of writers and a content manager and a, you know, manager and link builders and PR, um, and so you, you need something to keep everyone together. So these are some of the ways that you can do it. Um, you can do a shared Trello calendar. You can do a Google calendar. You know, there are WordPress plugins for editorial content, Basecamp, Asana, whatever your your tool of choice is. Um, one of these places you need to have a constant calendar. Um, I, I like doing it in Trello. They have a, a calendar view. Um, Google Calendar, we use that at Distilled, and it worked really well for assigning, uh, for assigning posts. Um, and now is the time when you build out your promotion workflows. Um, promotion, just like just like creation, has to be has has to have a workflow to it. There's a you know there's a science and an art um, to this as well. So this is the flow um, that worked for us. We're we're throwing some more bodies at promotion. And at this point, I had a content manager, a PR manager, uh, three uh, three guys that were full time um, building links. Um, for hot pads, and it, you know, they're great at getting uh, content placed. Um, and so this is this is the flow that we had, where you know we we br we brainstorm, settle on the topic, begin producing, um, and then uh, as the idea was coming along and, and taking form, as the content was coming along, this is where we started prospecting for outreach, right, from the data side, from the guest post side, that sort of thing, um, and setting a launch date um, and get and telling them when it was going to go live. And then on launch, of course, we published the content. The automatic marketing happened. Um, and then doing uh, manual outreach to pre-created pre-created lists of people, right on the PR side um, and on the you know on the blog side. So th th this workflow is, as you can see, it's starting it, it's starting to go, and it, you know we're we're not just you know once again trying to figure out how do we come up with ideas or you know how do we how do we promote it, but th th there's actually a process that's uh, that's in place now. And so going from a, a motorcycle to a car, we can put four, six, eight people, depending on, on how big your you know how big your car is. Um, now's the time to bring in really dedicated promotion. This is this is kind of pouring the fire or pouring the gas on the fire that you already have. Um, and a, a dedicated PR professional won't be fully leveraged until you have your creation and publishing process figured out. Um, I had a phenomenal one at, at Hot Pads, and she did a, she did a great job helping us to to kind of uh, optimize our process for for outreach. Um, and she was responsible for the tier one publications, um, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Boston.com, you know, getting covered. We got coverage in all of those. Um, and uh, so th those needed a relationship and a softer pitch touch. And this is where we also layered on scalable manual outreach. So we publish a piece and the PR uh, manager would, would go and, you know, promote it to her contacts. And then uh, my, uh, my manual outreach guys would go and, um, and, and send it to uh, send it to blogs and that sort of thing. Tier two, tier three, right? Guest posts, social shares, permitted influencers asking for them, uh, email list inclusions, uh, and all of this should be included within within your outreach, right? Don't just think about links, um, but also think about you know who has a big email list that they're sending out targeted content, um, you know that that you could get your content uh, listed in. You know I've I've seen these drive you know thousands of visits um, to to my sites and to my businesses um, from doing this. Um, so after we hired, so, so now we, you know, we have all these people on the team, and, and stuff is really, really ticking along. And this allowed us to do some really cool, 
really cool content. That was, that was really, really fun. So after we hired PR and we kind of had this whole system in place, um, some of the content that we did, here's one example that I love, where we did one about, um, th there's uh, sites called there's, uh, Dieden House, and then after the other one is like Methan House or something like that, where basically they have data about um, uh, houses where people have died. And people care about this when they're buying um, a house, and then also like former meth houses. And so we partnered with them and created these maps, uh, heat maps for our, for our major cities, and did outreach around those. Um, and they got, they got a bunch of shares, way more shares than we had had um, for a lot of our other content. Um, and so, you know, looking for just like the raw amplification, this work, this content worked really, really well for us. And this is all due to the, our PR manager. This is one of our, our best examples where we did a, a piece of content about where graduates should move. And it was timely, right? We talked earlier about content being timely. Um, and uh, this we published in about March or April of 20, uh, 2015, last year, um, about a month before uh, people before college students graduated, talked about where they should move, right? And so, you know, their parents were sending it to them, and uh, and it worked out. It worked out super well. So we got a lot of links here, and this is where we where we uh, you know had the had the promotion engine going. We had the PR engine, the the manual uh, promotion engine going. We actually wrote guest posts for a lot of sites um, as well, and used the used the embeddables that we had, embeddable maps um, for every city that we had in those. Uh, in those pieces, so it was pretty easy, um, pretty easy guest posting, and, and we were actually able to scale it while keeping the quality really high. And we got a bunch of like, so this just shows nine, but I think we actually got like 20 to 25 um, to this to this piece, and it worked well because we offered the right the content, we offered our data scientists as a source. Um, we had one that we were partnered with, um, and you know he was able to explain the data succinctly. We pr we practiced it ahead of time so that we knew exactly what our pitch was, um, and it worked really really well. Um, and, and we used we used that process that I talked about uh, that I talked about already. Um, this is exactly what we used in order to uh, to, to get the content out. Um, and then uh, you know deciding to it, now you, now you have the engine going. Uh, now it's time to figure out how can you how can you scale it right? How do you take it to the next level with keeping quality in mind and, and realizing that there is some point that you're going to reach where there's basically content saturation. Um, and no one you know you, you don't want to turn your customers off or your potential customers off because you're putting out too much content. Um, but figuring out you know new interesting stuff that you can that you can do, um, and this is going to take you know probably a bigger team. You know the more more hands on deck that you have, the more the more in, uh, content you're going to be able to create. Um, but we basically realized that we we were doing a blog post about every day, but we could only really do one great research study uh, about every two months because otherwise we were saturating our you know our journalist contacts and blog contacts um, with it, and that we just weren't getting the reception if we went if we went more often. If we did any faster, we you know we'd lose the quality, um, and and we just didn't have the uh, people just weren't open to it, and it didn't it didn't work uh, nearly as well. And then we measured it and we optimized it. Uh, we optimized it over time. So now we have now we have liftoff. Um, and w once you have all of these pieces ticking, you can have some real you can have a lot of fun with content. Um, and and uh, having all these pieces in place really allows us to do some fun stuff. So we did some PR stunts. Where we uh, so when House of Cards launched, I'm a big House of Cards fan, and we put the the House of Cards townhouse um, on the uh, on the market, um, quote unquote, on the market as a as a live listing, um, where basically we said like, hey Frank, uh, apologies to all of you that I'm about to to spoil House of Cards for you if you haven't watched season three, um, but basically uh, the the main character is moving into the White House, and so their uh, their townhouse is up for rent, and so we we put this as a live listing and outreached it. Um, and we got Curb National, which was big. We got Rolling Stone Italy, huge. Um, and then we got Today.com as well. Um, all of these, all of these linking to us um, about uh, about this listing, right? And, and Today.com is huge. My boss emailed me and was like, "You got a link from Today.com?" We're all like, "That's amazing." So uh, that that one worked really well. And then my my content manager wrote a post about um, you know that the, the, and this is the expertise part, knowing your market. Um, where San Francisco's rental market, where I live, is insane. Um, and people are always talking about um, the the non-availability of uh, of housing on the, you know on the market. And so my content manager was like, "Simple pool say, let's write about Alcatraz being sold and divided up into micro apartments." Um, and she she wrote it, and people were like, "You've got to be kidding me!" And so we we ended up getting a link from Realtor.com, which is uh, our our parent company's biggest rival. Um, to, you know, to our to our content, they you know they thought it was hilarious. This is the, you know this is the value of of Fantastic content where you know they, they wrote about us even though we're you know we are uh, a rival um, of theirs got a, got a ton of shares on Facebook 
um, you know, got some tweets, got, even got some plus ones, um, which is, you know, fantastic. And, you know, I, I'm not going to dog on Google Plus too bad because I think it's cool for a lot of things. Uh, but we got, we got some, some uh, plus ones as well. And this sort of timely content, this is just thinking outside the box where I saw um, a New York Times journalist writing about um, the Obamas and when they leave office and they were looking for a place in uh, Rancho Mirage, California. Um, this is the, apparently the house that they were looking at. Um, and I, I wrote a piece about sh should they rent, uh, should they buy or rent uh, there, you know, just based off of what the market says. And I said to them, sorry, it was LA Times. Um, and they, they tweeted it for me. Um, you know, they showed it out and we established a great media contact um, from it. Uh, and so here's just some quick rapid fire lessons that we that we learned. Your, your learnings may be different. We realize big content better than small content. Blog content is usually more shareable. Uh, big, big content, you know, our big articles got a lot more uh, linking root domains um, and uh, and LinkedIn shares. Um, we gave embeddable assets so people could embed them and and play around with them. These are maps um, based off of the data that we had. Uh, content lives and dies by outreach. Uh, before we had outreach really in place, we weren't getting nearly as big of a bang for our buck as we were after we had great content. So great content uh, will get links with outreach, but it, really, it will really get them without. You know, you can't just click, can't just click publish. Um, and then your success depends on your team's execution of ideas. When we executed well, um, we, we, we saw a lot of great, uh, great things happen. We did have one piece that we launched about a week or two late, and it kind of flopped because journalists were like, sorry, you missed your deadline. So you have to, you have to execute and follow, you know, follow on your word. Um, and then, as I said, keep trying new ideas and measures. These are all the iterations that we went through. As I said, some of them worked, some of them didn't. You know, be quick to cut uh, when they're when they're not. Um, and then another one is, is launch launch uh, content around new things that are happening, right? So when I rebranded my company a couple weeks ago, I created this simple flowchart about should you do SEO. Had some fun with it. Got got great reception. You know, it was a, a great way to kind of get people familiar uh, with my new brand. Um, so that, that's another uh, thought for things that you should do. And then also cheat with uh, cheat with promotion, right? I'm part of some uh, uh, you know some groups that I can ask people to you know to share some content, and, and most people are, um, and and got got a lot of shares, and, and so you know great people uh, sharing all of these organically, um, you know based off of based off of that. So cheat with your promotion, get the you know get the bump as you can see here. That that middle bump in November was a product hunt launch, and then the one there uh, end of January was uh, my rebrand launch of that piece of content that I just showed you. So you know this can this can get you a good bump in, and keep the content keep the uh, traffic going, and then always be playing be playing the long game. This is a, a quote that I love from from Gary Vee. Um, you know don't don't be playing the sprint. Don't be looking for quick hits. Um, you know quick hits can be can be great. You know PR stunts are is what that is, but they're just stunts. They're not lasting. You know it's not a it's not a machine. Um, you know that, that's going to keep going. It's going to keep bringing you know bringing you back. Um, so that's that's what I have. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And now I will take any questions from the audience. Awesome, John. Thank you so much. I know I've gotten a bunch of questions saying, will you send the slides? Will we send the recording? And yes, we will send that out tomorrow morning so you guys can recap since I know John's packed in all the goodies into this 30 minutes. Uh, so a couple of questions. If you have any, please send them our way or, or hashtag VMWebinar on Twitter. We've got one from Ginny. She asks, I'm curious about the appropriate mix between awareness and sales in the marketing funnel. To what extent should you drive awareness content versus including sales offers or calls to action? In your experience, how much does awareness drive sales? That's a great, that's a fantastic question. That's a loaded. Um, I, yeah, it's a, it's a very loaded question. It's a very complicated one. Um, I, I love it. It's 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 a great it's a great question. I think it, honestly, it depends it depends on your company and what you have in place, right? Um, you know, and and the type of comp type of company that you are. You know, if you're a, a very like B two B you know B two B company, um, you know, you're not looking to build a huge audience, right? Uh, how bad is B two C, right? So we wanted to build a big audience of millions of people, um, you know, which which we did. Um, and so you know, so for us, it was all it was all about um, awareness, right? Um, and so I, I didn't dig deep into uh, you know a lot of the other like you know I talked about like email marketing for content um, and, and by the way I have I actually haven't announced this anywhere else but I'm working on a, an ebook talking about startup email marketing um, which should launch in a few weeks hopefully um, but there's a lot of other email marketing that we did that was more conversion oriented that was outside of content so we treated this content as top of as top of funnel um, acquisition but you know if you're if you're you know you you kind of have your top of funnel um, you know just raw acquisition taken care of then you know, th then bringing in the other the other pieces of content like ebooks and and that sort of thing. Just realizing that um, you know that that's going to be that needs to be informed by your own you know your own KPIs. If your team is 
is you know tasked with driving revenue, not just you know unique users, then you know you're going to need more conversion oriented content. But you can follow, but you follow the same process um, as I have as I've outlined here. Yeah, I agree, John. I know we definitely go to that philosophy too. And we always say, let's create the helpful, useful content that's answering people's questions and then use the wrapper of our website, you know, the logo, the branding and the CTAs to really push them down the funnel. And then like you mentioned, the eBooks are the higher generate, lead generating efforts to help kind of move people along. So I would agree with that. And, you know, just using that idea of useful content first and foremost that someone would find relevant. Totally, and there are so many other ways to, you know, to, to do that promotion to, or to do promotion once you get them into the funnel as well, right? Or to keep them engaged. You know, I talked a little bit about that, but promoted social media posts, re, you know, retargeting that sort of thing. You know, that that you, you drop a pixel on them, you know, and, and this can be content that's created like by you know by your sales team, um, you know, to uh, that you know that they like to give prospects. Um, you know, so, so these two very much work in tandem. Sales teams, they have the best best content probably already written in their sent messages folders. So it's a good totally. to look. Totally. If you're if you're a marketer, spend time with your sales team. They know exactly like what uh, you know what what your audience is looking for. Yeah. And then John, I've got a couple of questions coming in um, that are similar. So basically what is some advice you could impart about being a one man team, a one woman team, and actually doing some of this stuff. So would you recommend focusing on getting shorter blog posts up more frequently or more valuable, lengthier pieces less often? Uh, I say test them both. Uh, it, it's really, it's, it's really going to depend, right? And part of this is also what you enjoy doing. If you like, you know, the, the shorter, shorter blog posts and, you know, you enjoy doing that kind of thing and cranking those out, like, you know, do that. Like, look for what's scalable for you and what what you can keep on doing. If you, you know, some people will write super long blog posts, you know, thousands of words, and they publish like one a month. You know, personally, I get you know 80% done with that, and I just don't want to finish. I have so many sitting like in my, you know, in my drafts folder. Um, so, but like, I I am a one man band here at here at Credo. I'm doing I'm doing everything. There are some ways to you know to speed this sort of thing up and to to take some of the work off of your plate. Um, one of my secrets, I, I haven't shared this anywhere else, is uh, I use a tool called AskWonder.com that basically if I'm doing research, um, you know, on like differences between different service providers or whatever, um, I ask them and they, they go and they do the research within 24 hours. I have, you know, a lot of research about this topic um, and then take that and turn it into a blog post and it costs me 20 bucks every time. Wow. Right? Super cheap, but, but, it, but it literally removes three to four hours of work on my end, right? And so what you, was can, that? you can hack it. You can, what was the domain ask, name? It's called Wonder. I believe it's askwonder.com. Okay, cool. Well, um, I, I love it. My wife, my wife turned me on to it, and I, I absolutely love it. Cool. And then I think that kind of bridges to another question of, you know, both the quality versus quantity debate. But there was something on one of your slides I had noticed where you said it wasn't the sexiest of content, but it got the job done. So I think that I would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, creating that foundation of content before you start doing the cute and clever stuff. Is that something that a one man show could focus on is really that foundational content that is meeting someone's search intent? Yeah, totally. I mean, that, that's definitely one way one way to go about it. Um, yeah, where you're you know you're going and you're doing your your keyword research just like you do you know for SEO for uh, you know for other parts of your site you know and having this you know be having that content be data informed. You know, if someone's searching for you know content marketing strategies or something like that, you know, you look at the pieces that are you know that have been created and they're all like you know they're all super long um, you know and super in depth. And so you know going and doing that differently um, you know doing it. Doing it better, so yeah, I, I think that's a, a great way to go about it. Um, you know, I, I like to kind of attack it from a bunch of different ways, right? Create content that is social because that gets you a new audience. Create content that is search oriented because that gets you a different audience from the social audience. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I I don't know that I have uh, you know I don't really have a formula um, you know for that. For me, it's okay. That, you know, I think I haven't done this sort of content in a while. You know, and it worked well last time. You know, so I'm going to do it. And then as I see it, um, you know, continuing to work, then I keep on doing it. Um, but that, that becomes a lot easier once you have once you have a team, um, for sure. And then we got a question about email from Jennifer, since you just mentioned that. So talking about email drip campaigns, what's a surefire way to get audiences to open the emails? Is there a formula for enticing email titles? Is there a move towards a more interactive email campaign? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, the, the, gosh, there are so many tips out there. There's been a lot of research done. I think MailChimp. Um, which is who I use for Credo at this point. Um, 
Yeah, they're fantastic. A fantastic company. Um, they've done a bunch of research um, on it. Uh, so it, you know, often it's it's shorter. Um, and I, I have a whole chapter about this in the ebook, but there's which is actually going to be a drip uh, a drip email campaign. Um, so that that might be part of your answer right there. That that's the kind of content that I'm investing in. Um, but you know, keeping your subject line shorter, uh, you know, it, making people curious about you know what's inside. Um, you know, th there are a lot of like tricks that you can do. You know, some um, like Gmail will show uh, emojis in subject lines, um, and so if no one, no one in your, uh, you know, in your group, in your, um, your area, you know, if your competitors are doing that, like, might be something to try to kind of catch their eye and, you know, and get them, um, get them in there. So, I, but I think one of the big things is, a, is a consistent, a consistent cadence. Um, you know, and when you're starting, like, you're not going to be getting a lot of opens, but as you keep on, you know, as you keep on going and emailing them consistently, and it's content that, uh, you know, that meets their needs then you're going to see a lot more, uh, a lot better open rates. Um, and, and you'll know that if it's not meeting their needs, if, you know, if they're not opening, they're not clicking through, thinking through, okay, why, you know, why didn't that work? And then put, you know, re reformulating your, you know, coming up with new hypotheses and, um, and trying new solutions. Awesome. And then you had mentioned strategies, John, and that they're not set in stone. So I know you mentioned you don't have a lot of formulas for this, but are there any best practices for going back and assessing your strategy at certain time intervals? Is it quarterly? Is it all the time? Or do you do bigger assessments, you know, yearly? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's a great, that's a great question. I think, so obviously it starts with realizing or thinking about where you want to go. Um, with it, right? So, so once again, going back to those KPIs and setting those and setting goals, right? And saying, you know, like working with my with my content manager at Hotpads, we asked, okay, what you know, what do we think that we can get this to? And so we set, you know, we set like, a, okay, if we can get it to this number, then like we've done our job. If we get to this number, then we've done like a really good job. If we get to this number, this kind of our our big, our BHAG, our big hairy audacious goal, um, you know, and and that's really what we were shooting for, right? If you're if you're you know shooting for the stars, you know, you might not hit the stars, but you're going to hit the moon, and then you're off Earth, right? Um, so, and, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in just the constant, you know, constant, uh, you know, seeing what's, seeing what's working, um, you know, so, so every day I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at metrics, um, but then also it, it is good to go back, and we would do, like, we would do monthly, uh, reviews, um, with, uh, you know, like, with our, with our superiors, um, you know, about, you know, what was working and what traffic we drove and, you know, conversions and, and all that sort of thing, so monthly, monthly is, is how we did it. I also like going back and looking, you know, and looking quarterly because then you can kind of get that meta, that meta analysis, you know, going on. And it might look short term like something's working really well, right. but then like those customers aren't sticking around. Um, so uh, yeah, like you know, keep, keep an eye on it daily. Um, you know, measure it monthly, and then uh, on, and I would say reevaluate every like you know three to six months because you you want to give it enough time to start working. Um, you know, so you don't want to be changing your strategy every month. Um, you know, and, and plus you're going to drive yourself and your team crazy. So uh, do it, yeah, I would, I would say do it about every like three to six months, you know, just ask yourself those hard questions of, you know, what, what, what do we need to tweak here? And then you mentioned something, John, on one of your slides, uh, the best way to get people involved is controversy. Can you speak to that? And what <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone out there has seen these, well, m maybe not, but, um, you know, I, I, there, there's a, a publication in San Francisco that I, I used to love that, uh, you know, they they would write posts about like you know is is San Francisco the new Brooklyn or is you know San Francisco the new Manhattan that sort of thing kind of pitting like pitting people against each other mm -hmm. um, in a, in in a friendly way not in a you know not in, not in a mean way at all but like you know people love at least you know for us like people loved you know people love where they live right they love their city that was actually our tagline um, for a while there um, you know people love their city and they're and they're always willing you know, to debate it or think about like in the digital marketing world, right? Like, should you do SEO or SEM or should you do SEO or CRO, right? People are going to debate that stuff to no end and that'll, you know, and that'll, that gets them, you know, that gets them talking and, you know, and you're involved in that conversation. Um, so that's the sort of controversy, you know, that I'm talking about asking, you know, asking those questions and, you know, engaging your community that way. Yeah, it's so true. We actually always preach five types of content to start doing. And one of them is versus like this versus this, like a comparison because people just eat it up. So totally agree with you there. Totally. Um, I've got one more question here before we close out. Um, so this is from Nicholas. He has, have you seen good results on sales or other measurable results when it comes to remarketing and your audience acquired from content posts? 
I I honestly I'm not the best person to to ask about that. I've done I've done a bit, and it you know it'll keep people coming through. I know there are, there are people that have been experimenting with it a lot, and they've you know they've they've figured out. You know some of it, like I know, like like uh, Patty Mugan at at Era in the UK, you know, has done a good bit of this. I see a lot of people um, doing it. I haven't invested in it um, a ton, um, but I know I know people are you know definitely seeing um, you know good uh, good results from it, right? And also think about like what do those results mean? Like is it you know is it direct to sales? Like if they just came in on a content piece, you know probably not. But this is your funnel where you bring them in, you know, via social or search or whatever. You know, you drop a retargeting pixel on them, you bring them back, you get them into a content upsell, and you get their email address and bring them on down the funnel, right? Um, so, you know, different parts of marketing are going to work at different part, work better or worse at different parts of the funnel. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate you being here. I know I have a lot of questions that's still unanswered, so I'll try to reach out to all of you. Thanks for the new tool, too. I have a couple of people asking. It's askwonder.com, like you're wondering, yep. askwonder.com. Um, and of course, we do this every month, so please join us next month. I think it's actually St. Patty's Day on March 17th. We're going to have optimization expert Tim Ash on board, and he'll be discussing why content marketing is failing and how to save it. So registration should be open for that on our site soon. And then of course we will follow up with an email tomorrow morning with both the recording and the slides of John's webinar today. So thank you again. Thank you, John. We really appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Thank you, Quinn. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.